over China. Sichuan Province, a massive civil engineering project on the Chengdu Plain, gave way for thousands of years of brilliant history. The project leader, Li Bing, has since been celebrated by the local population as the ancestor of Sichuan. How did a simple irrigation project influence the industrialization of Sichuan? Watch as Discover China reveals the ancestor of Sichuan, Li Bing. This is the rich Chengdu Plain in western China. Being an important lifeline, waters run through the cities and the countryside, feeding and nurturing the magnificent culture here. Waters have contributed to the bountiful wealth on the plain, bearing the spirits of heaven and earth. With enduring momentum, the waters run on. The water comes from the Min River, northwest of Chengdu. Built about 2,250 years ago, this levee was built to direct and channel the waters into the Chengdu Plain. To this day, this levee still plays an important role to the industries contributing to the wealth of this area. At the end of the 4th century BC, China was on the eve of national unification, but the nation was in turmoil. Many neighboring states were still fighting for borders. Far in the north was the powerful Qin Kingdom. At the time, the King of Qin debated with his chancellors the best strategy for taking over all of China. A Qin official named Sima Tsuo had suggested first Qin should take over the neighboring southwest state of Shu. The state of Shu, the ancient name for Sichuan, was located at the upstream of the Yangtze River. Sailing downstream, the Qin army could easily take over the Shu, the only kingdom between Qin and the kingdom of Chu. Chu was the final hurdle before China's unification. Sima Tsuo's strategy was adopted. Sima Tsuo started to realize the king's ambition. He led 100,000 soldiers and 10,000 warships into Chengdu and set up his base of operations. After advancing onto the city of Chengyu in the Chu Kingdom, present-day Fuling in Chongqing province, the Qin army had a problem. Supplies could not be replenished. Sima Tsuo's army was trapped in Shengyu. The war was lost. This loss led them to realize the fatal mistake in their strategy. The supply base in Chengdu was just too far from the river where they had begun their attack. Soon afterwards, the plan for diverting the Ming River into Chengdu started to brew. In 272 BC, King Zhao of Qin appointed Li Bing, a young man of only 30, as the governor of Shu. was to convert the Shu state into a strategic military base for Qin to make another attempt at unifying China. 
At that time, the Chengdu Plain was suffering from frequent floods caused by the untamed Ming River. People called the area the Flood Plain. After taking office, Li Bing traveled the 700 kilometers along the banks of the source of the Ming River to conduct his research. focused on how he could lead the water to Chengdu by building an irrigation system, yet keep the water under control to maintain its constant and steady flow. Li Bing thought by determining the right path for water, the cities on the plain also would benefit from the project. The Min River, originating from the snowy mountains between Yansu and Sichuan provinces, was the longest and largest branch of the upper Yangtze River. Thousands of running streams into the gorge form this river, but due to the force of the descent, the water falls rapidly and storms onto the plain like wild horses. The river had many turns, and the riverbed was wide and prone to changes. The river's flow was uneven over the course of a year. thought to himself, where should this irrigation channel be built to best control the river? Here is an irrigation map for Du Jiang Yan from the Qing Dynasty. In Chinese, Yan stands for dam. This map shows the network of waterways on the Chengdu Plain. Notice how all the waterways originated from a single point, Du Jiang Yan. After three years of theories, a water plan was ready. In order to allow for river navigation near Chengdu, a levee must be built on the Ming River to divert and control its flow. Construction of the levee would be the key to a successful supply chain for the pending war. After surveying the region, Li Bing chose to build Du Jiang Yan, meaning Chengdu River Dam, where the hills sloped onto the plains. The Ming River was thus being harnessed in by the dam at its neck. In 268 BC, Li Bing started to lead tens of thousands of workers to build the Du Jiang Yan. Bamboo baskets loaded with pebbles were ferried and dumped onto the center of the river. Four years of hard labor, a water diversion dike in the shape of a large fish's mouth was erected. When the water reached the dike, the river was then diverted into two streams, the inner river and the outer river. The inner river was supposed to channel the water to Chengdu. Unfortunately, Mount Jian in the northwest of Chengdu Plain was blocking the river. How to get the river through the mountain became the next challenge. Cutting into the middle of Mount Jian seemed to be the only solution to get the river directed onto the Chengdu Plain. Even with today's modern machinery, such a project would be difficult to accomplish in a short period of time. During the time of Warring States period, 
There was no gunpowder or other advanced explosives. The only tools available were manual steel drills and stone hammers. To cut Mao Jian using these tools would normally take 30 years, but Qin's unification mission could wait no longer. What could Li Bing do? By today's standards, we must commend Li Bing's innovative and cunning wisdom. came up with an ingenious way to cut a path through the mountain. By superheating the mountain's face with wood and fire, and then allowing chilly river water to quickly cool the mountain's stony base, the rocks would then become brittle and break more easily with the simple stone hammers and primitive iron drills. This heating and cooling method allowed for an easier and swift tunneling through the mountain's thick core. After eight years of excavation, Mount Jian finally opened up on the other end at Tiger Head Rock. Creating a 20 meter waterway for the river to flow through, the Ming River was finally flowing onto the Chengdu Plain. In appreciation of Li Bing's ingenuity for cutting through the mountain, the water pass was named the Bottleneck Channel. Through it, the river now ran into the plain and enriched the soil for generations. In 256 BC, after 14 years of construction, Du Jian Yan, a pioneering feat in the world of irrigation history, was completed. From then on, ships transporting timber for the construction of warships started to float smoothly on the waterway into Chengdu. Chengdu became a consolidating center for both soldiers and arms. The local people began to dig canals to bring water onto their farmland. A huge fan-shaped canal network began to change the look of the plain and the nearby hills. Within only a few decades, the Sichuan Basin became a rich agricultural region with over 10,000 acres of abundant farmland. At the time, Qing's growing strength steadily increased and soon it became the nation's strongest kingdom. In 223 BC, millions of Qing soldiers sailed down the Ming River to the Yangtze River. They took over the kingdom of Chu with a single blow. Two years later, Qing unified China. This was the first central powered empire China had known. The Qing Dynasty was founded. Two thousand years later, we are still witnessing the seemingly simple appearance of the Du Jiangyan Dam and can enjoy the smooth water flow around it. Still today, this magnificent levee plays a critical role in draining flood water and irrigating farms on the plain. Even today, Li Bing's incredible ingenuity and philosophy on water management is revered for his contributions on one of the most impressive civilizations in ancient China. How does an ancient levee, originally built for the purposes of war, 
still prove useful to modern people after 2,000 years. What is the secret of its engineering design? Li Bing chose to build the Du Zhang Yan at the turn of the Ming River, where the river could be channeled to the main body of the levee naturally. The levee consists of three main parts, namely the fish mouth levee, the bottleneck channel, and the flying sandware, Fei Xia Yan, at the end of the fish mouth dam. All three work in perfect harmony to control the flow and channel the river. The fish mouth levee divides the river into the inner and outer river. Under normal conditions, about 60% of the mean river is diverted to the inner river for navigational and irrigation purposes. However, in the summer, during the flood season, more than 60% of the mean river is automatically diverted to the outer river by the levee to protect the Chengdu plain from flooding. This is due to the application of the laws of dynamics. The outer river joins the Yangtze River afterwards. The bottleneck channel, being the final entrance to the inner river, controls the violent streams during flood season. When the water overflows, they pour into the outer river via the flying sandware as an additional redirection. Furthermore, the sand and mud sedimentation problems that trouble all levees were addressed in a most creative way. At the diversion point of the Fishmouth Channel, the inner river bank is lower than the outer one. At this turn in the river, decided by the laws of water flow, the water on the surface of the Min River flows to the lower inner river, while the water at the bottom flows to the outer river. The majority of the sands carried away by the flow of the outer river water, although all of the silt and sediment is not entirely kept away from the inner river. As the water rushes to the cliff, it forms a whirlpool, which carries the sands over the flying sandware and then onto the outer river. The stronger the water flow, the higher the rate of sand removal, reaching about 98% in most cases. The three parts of Du Jiang Yan Dam interact perfectly to resolve the problem of sand and silt deposits, thus preventing flooding. The application of the laws on these water sources at Du Jiang Yan Dam make it a model project in the history of the world channeling water resources. After completing the construction of the Du Jiang Yan Dam, Li Bing made it a rule for the riverbed to be serviced every year. During the dry season, the government organized workers to clear the riverbed to a certain depth. Li buried a stone horse under the riverbed in front of the bottleneck channel to show the workers at what depth is ideal for their digging. When digging the riverbed, whenever the stone horse could be seen, workers knew they had dug to the right depth. If they had dug too deep, the inner river would overflow and the irrigation fans would be threatened. If they dug too shallow, there would be too little water in the inner river and the plain would suffer a drought. During the Ming Dynasty, the stone horse was replaced with a more solid iron block. Li's experience of clearing the riverbed's depth while building the dike low is still a classic rule in practice since its inception more than 2,000 years ago. After faithfully serving the Sichuan region for more than 2,000 years, Du Jiang Yan Dam is still doing so. The irrigation area increased from 1 million acres during the Qin and Han dynasties to more than 10 million acres today. The powerful Eastern philosophy and natural way of controlling water has earned Du Jiang Yan Dam a place in nature and history. It continues to endure and retains its vitality today. ancient time, Chinese people were already aware of the natural way of controlling water by channeling instead of blocking. The founder of Taoism, Li Ar, suggested the philosophy that Tao should follow nature, which was practiced by Li Bing as he built the dam in an attempt to control the water. Different from the modern ideologies practiced in water resource management projects, 
Lee didn't build a dam to fight the water. He used flexible textured bamboo baskets with pebbles and stones inside to control the water. Described in Chinese culture as the soft overcomes the hard, the water flow and direction was controlled naturally by following and utilizing the force generated by the turn of the river and the angle of the cliff. The project was a perfect and harmonious combination of human efforts working with the laws of nature. Open the waterways to Chengdu. Resources from other places gathered at the state of Shu. The prosperity of Chengdu was shown vividly on this unearthed hand brick. On two main rivers leading to Chengdu, the Fu River and the Nan River, ships sailed from all corners of the country. The 10,000 miles Golden Waterway took shape. Within 400 years from the Qing Dynasty to the West Han Dynasty after Du Zhengyan Dam was built, the economy of the state of Shu prospered. The local people had bountiful supplies. With these inexhaustible resources, Sichuan Basin became known as the Warehouse of the Heavens. Throughout China's history, temples honoring Li Bing were built. It has become a tradition for the people of Shu to worship Li Bing with love, appreciation, and respect. Today, a new city stands by the 2,000-year-old ancient dam. Canals can be seen running by or under the streets and lanes of the city. Like the city's blood, water runs through its veins peacefully and smoothly. Houses are built near the water, and people live a serene and comfortable life in this peaceful oriental Venice. To commemorate this water resources project, that has benefited generations, the city was officially renamed Du Zhengyan City. Water is the source of all living things for his greatest deed of redirecting the main river and changing the future for generations in the Chengdu Plain. Li Bing has earned the title Ancestor of Sichuan. <laughs>